Go ahead and, and do things that you maybe are interested in, but you don't think it's going to get you towards your goal. Just go ahead and do it anyway. You'll it'll be you'll be um, surprised at how you'll have to, you're able to incorporate that into your into your life and into your work. back. Today is Wednesday, and as usual, we have another amazing guest. Today, we are talking with Stan Prokopenko, who you probably know him as Proko. Um, one of, are you the, I feel like you're the king of figure drawing on YouTube, but uh, <laughs> there may be some contenders, but. Uh, I don't know. I don't think anyone's said anything about a king or anything. Pencil uh, Kings. Pencil Kings podcast. We're, we're talking the kings here today. <laughs> uh, so yeah, welcome to the to the to the call stand for anybody that doesn't know who you are uh, could you just give a quick like one minute overview of of what you do and, and who you help um so that people get a sense and then we'll just dive into the conversation uh yeah i mean i guess i'm mostly known for the tutorials i create um the video tutorials i make on youtube um mostly they're targeted towards people that want to learn <clears throat> like fine art but it, uh, like you were saying earlier it was it's a cross there's a crossover between illustration and and comics and you know all, all the art genres can benefit with figure drawing um, and right now I'm teaching anatomy I did a portrait course before we just launched a caricature course so there's a lot of drawing people basically um, so far um, and they're very thorough um, I think a lot of people like that the lessons are kind of fun I put a lot of jokes in there I have animation like 3d characters kind of by my side so that, that's what I'm mostly known for, but I'm also an artist, not just a teacher. I mostly do oil paintings. Um, lately, I haven't been doing as many as I'd like to because I've been uh, making videos, but um, if they go on my website, stanperkopenko.com, they'll see a lot of fine art paintings. Also, just mostly people. I like painting people. I like studying people. So yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, so excited to, to have you here because I really... I think there's so, so many things that you're doing right with like the videos that you're doing online. Um, and it's really, I think, kind of like the gold standard for art education right now. It's just something that, you know, I really believe that when whatever you're trying to do with your art, if you can look at somebody and you're trying to like compare yourself to the best person that you can find and don't get bent out of shape about it. Like I don't feel bad if you're not uh, as good as, as some other artist, but that's a way that you can always like critique yourself and just hold what you do up against somebody else's work and just say like, okay, is this up to the level of this other thing? So I think that's, um, that's great. And it's amazing that you're putting all this out for free. Um, what I'm really curious about talking with you today is, um, we talk a lot about mindset and I'm curious because I know you've worked with a lot of students and I'm sure you get a, you know, a deluge of emails every day mm -hmm. of people asking you things or comments on your videos. And, um, I'm wondering if there's any like really big hangups that you've seen people have with their art where they kind of get stuck and they're not able to move forward um, because I know that they're from, from talking with people that they, they do get stuck and I don't like that. I want people to be able to create freely and to continue to move forward uh, with what they're doing. So I'm wondering if there's hmm. places where you've th seen people get really stuck and if there's any insights into how you've help people get past that. Like obviously there's the videos, but I, I think there's other things that people reveal in emails and when they have uh, conversations or if you meet them at a conference. Now, are you referring to getting stuck in creating their own art or in like learning how yeah. to draw? Oh, it could be both. And, yeah. and if you want to go into both, but uh, yeah. Well, which one were you? Referring? Either one. Uh, I, was, I was referring to um, getting stuck like where they're just – what I feel is that people can sometimes get into a loop. So they're just constantly like making the same mistakes over and over and over again, and they're not able to move forward. Um, and, and so let, let's talk about that first. Okay. So as far as getting stuck in your art, I, I kind of have a similar issue right now. I'm trying to figure things out. When I asked Steve Houston about it, he's a, like my hero. He, he's amazing. Um, he t said, you got to start with why. Figure out why you're doing it, and then once you know why, you'll figure out how to do it. So that's, you know, 
for creating art. I, I think for things I've noticed when people are trying to learn how to draw, um, I think people maybe stick with their comfort in their comfort zone a little too much. You know, like they um, people don't cross train enough. Do you know what I mean by that? I, I do, but please please explain because I, yeah. I, I know that there's somebody out there that doesn't. Okay, so yeah, like cross training. Like, it, let's say you want to do still life painting. <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, you, you know, just because you're not going to draw people, or you're not going to draw cars, or or whatever, you just want to draw flowers. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go learn how to do that stuff. Or just just because you only want to work in acrylic paint doesn't mean you shouldn't learn oil or, or drawing or, and even digital. Just go ahead and cross train. Go ahead and learn all these other things because you're going to learn lessons from um, these different genres and different mediums that you wouldn't have learned just doing the specific thing that you want to do. Because every, every different tool or every different thing that you draw has its own specific lesson that it can teach you. And you can bring all that over to the things that you do. Like when I was when I was young, I was all over the place. I made videos as a little kid, just like I had my camera. We would replicate. Maybe my cousin would replicate. Um, sorry, replicate movies that we liked. Um, I was into computer programming. I was into drawing and painting. Uh, then in high school, I went to animation. Then after high school, I switched to fine art instead of animation. So, like I said, I was like all over the place, but then eventually all those things kind of came together for me, and I was able to use all of those things in creating my YouTube channel, and you think that that's one thing, a YouTube channel is one thing, but it was really a combination of like eight things that I was into as a kid, Um, and you know, the same thing applies in creating art. You can combine things in unique ways that other people have not combined to create something totally new and that's and that new thing that you created is you it's your own thing so go ahead and and do things that you maybe are interested in but you don't think it's going to get you towards your goal just go ahead and do it anyway you'll you'll be you'll be um surprised at how you'll have to, you're able to incorporate that into your into your life and into your work do you have any examples of some of the most random things you've ever done that's unrelated? And then when you look back, you're like, whoa, I, I just did that kind of on a whim, but it actually is really helpful for something that I'm working on right now. Well, I can't think of anything totally random, but when I think of like creating home videos and then oil painting and animation and computer programming, like those things don't seem like they can be all combined into one. Um, oh, and then teaching as well. I, I was a teacher at the school, at the Watts Atelier. Like all of those things combined into literally one thing that I do. I, I can't think of one thing that was just random. I mean, uh, I guess all of them were really random. I was just like, hey, what about doing, you know, what about programming websites? Like, wh- why would I start programming websites all of a sudden? I was in a drawing, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I can think of something totally random. That's okay. Um, yeah. I just wanted to add my two cents here of like of an example of cross training. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I've been trying to do lately is little studies of um, watercolor and oil painting books to see if I can recreate them digitally. And I, when I, you know, Bob Ross kind of had a big resurgence recently on Twitch and on Netflix. And I was like how do you do this in Photoshop? And it's, there's no, no tutorials on it that I I feel are like up to snuff. Um, so I just started to sit down and try and do it. I was like, wow, this is really difficult. Like this is a really, especially in Photoshop, there's some other tools that are easier to work with, but still it's, it's this crazy thing. And it's a really interesting challenge, um, by learning oil painting, not because I want to oil paint, but then just trying to replicate this and creating all kinds of new breakthroughs for myself and what I'm able to paint. Yeah. I'm I'm curious about the the reason why that you mentioned recently um, that you are, you know, for people who are s- stuck uh, making their art and they need the reason why so they can continue to move forward and and once they have that then everything will kind of you know fall into place naturally 
And you said you were struggling with it a bit yourself. I was wondering if you had that at one point and then you lost it. And I think like for me, I had it. I wanted to work in video games. And that drove me from the age of seven to the age of 30. And then I felt like, okay, I've done this, but I want to do something different now. And I create far less art than I ever have these days um, because I don't have a strong reason why for creating art. My reason why is in helping artists get past mindset issues and and advance their careers or get into careers. But I'm curious what, you know, what the introspective process has has been like for you uh, thinking about this reason why question. Yeah, well, about what you just said, I mean, your why changed. So I don't know if you necessarily lost it. I mean, maybe you lost it for for um, creating art temporarily, um, it just kind of your, your why shifted, which is fine. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's natural. Your, that your why shift. You should really you should really focus on one major why. If you focus on too many things at once, you're, you're going to dilute yourself and make a bunch of okay things. Um, but the same thing has happened to me, where my why before was all about creating art, and then I started teaching and I started making the videos and my why shifted towards like you teaching people how to draw and paint lately i've been kind of missing the creation of the art uh, maybe because the creation of the videos which is also an art form is getting a little bit easier for me now it's like okay i i, I get it this is how you do it and i want a bigger challenge um, I'm, I still want to create videos like that, that still really drives me, but I want to create something bigger, m- more, um, satisfying for myself. And, and it's for myself, you know, I said, I have the, the videos for other people for myself. I want to create art. And I, honestly, I haven't figured out the why yet. Like, why do I want to create art? I, the, the, the questions I've been asking myself are like, do I want to make a, some kind of statement in my art? Do I want to change the world? Or do I want to just make something that looks nice? You know, And I, I don't have an answer to that yet. I don't know. I'm not sure how to answer the why. <laughs> but I think well, yeah. <laughs> figuring out why is important. And until I do, it, I'm not going to really create anything that great. And um, f- for anybody who's wondering about this why question, there's been a, a lot of talk on it. And if you look up, I think it's Reason Why TED Talk. Yeah. Um, there's there's that Simon Sinek or yeah. Sinek or something. Sinek? I don't know. I mean, I know there's yeah. Sinek, Seneca. But si- Simon, Simon S. Reason <laughs> Why video. Yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're like, hey, I don't know what my reason why is. It, gets, it takes you through a very simple exercise where you can hopefully try and find it. But I think it's something that, um, you know, if it was easy, everyone would have the reason why. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people don't. Um, I went so, through his steps and I, I, I don't think I really came to a, a conclusion to why. <laughs> uh, I, I've heard another, uh, Steve Pavlino is a big uh, self-help writer yeah. and he had like how you find your reason why is you sit down and you start writing out ideas of what your reason why, like why you're on this planet, what are you working on, what are you doing and you keep writing and you keep writing and writing and writing until you come to a point where you start crying. And you literally start crying uh, once you find your reason why, because you're, it's been eluding you for so long. It's like finding the love of your life or something. Like maybe you've just been hunting for so long. And when you find this person, it's the perfect match. You're just like, wow, finally, like my life isn't complete without the why or this person. And um, in doing this, I tried doing the exercise and I couldn't get to work. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just, you know, heartless or, you know, I have a wooden heart or something and I can't cry from writing out this exercise. And then it did hit me eventually. One night I was sitting, I was reading a book on, on how do you write your own books. And then it really hit me that my, the reason why is that I'm here to um, enable other artists to pursue their passions and to get to the point where they want to with their career, just like what I did for myself, you know, years ago. And when I came to that, I, it was really late at night. I couldn't sleep. I'm reading this book. And I just started like bawling, like crazy bawling. Wow. It's just like, Whoa, it's it's here and it's it sounds so weird, but um yeah, if if somebody does the exercise and you start to cry, I would love to, you know, you know, hit me hit my inbox and let yeah, me know what, what you came to. So Steve Pavlina wrote one blog post about that, or did he do like a whole series? Because I used to read his, his stuff. I, I think know. it was just one blog post. Okay. Um but he was saying that you you know, it can take hours. You yeah. just sit there and you just and, keep uh, answering various why questions. 
just the same question. You just oh, like just write down di- different ideas. Of, of, yeah. Because it's hard to figure out the answer. But it, and, and that's where the crying the comes crying. in. That's that's how you know. <laughs> Uh, because I think a- after a certain point, like your brain becomes empty, and then you start grasping at things that you wouldn't naturally be able to huh. to grasp. So interesting. I wonder if it's you, you have to have a certain personality for that to work. That, that's what I thought too when I first tried it, and I was just like, "Oh, this doesn't work for me." But then no. that those were those events were years apart when I sat down and read okay. the you know how to how to write a book book. Okay, gotcha. Um, let's change directions a little bit. I'm I. Uh, when we were talking before, uh, I was curious about if you were to go back and, like, let's say there's um, Proko, age 15, 15. You, you know, has some chops, uh, loves art. Um, what would you give him as far as advice for studying if he's in today's time? Is it like, well, just go to the Proko channel and everything is there? <laughs> just go to the Proko channel. Um, or, or is there something no. different, like, in the path that you took? Because I feel like uh, it's it's cool when you can look back and just say like, oh, I did a lot of extra steps and I could have compressed this or been more focused. I think that's a common theme. But I'm yeah. curious for you specifically. Um, so, okay, I'll come back to your question. So you said sure. one thing that, that I kind of want to address. Like, go, I would tell him, go to the Proco website. Like, I don't think any one website will ever really replace schools like we can start online schools and all this stuff, but really they're more like books. They're just resources. You can't. Repl- I don't think personally. I don't think we'll be able to replace uh, a school environment, like an actual personal school environment with a mentor, like an atelier sort of system. Um, I think it's just like another book that you get. Hey, cool! Look at. I can study from this resource, and they're great. I think. I think videos can be much more useful than books. They're. They're. They can get you the information quicker and more efficiently than a book. Um, but, but I don't think I would tell the past me like, Hey, I just go to program.com. So, but I, what I have been thinking about lately, it's like, Oh man, I really wish I did this. And that is, I, I really wish that I focused more on drawing from my imagination because the first like 15 years of my development, I was focused completely on copying things drawing from reference, drawing from life, a lot of life drawing, which is good. I'm not saying I would totally get rid of that. I would just add like maybe 75% drawing from from life, 25% just drawing from my head, just trying to come up with random things, trying to visualize things and remember. Because I didn't I don't think I really trained my creativity and my visual memory as well as I could have at when I, at a younger age. I'm starting to try to do that now, but I know that if I was doing that when I was 16, when I started, I'd be so much better. So I'm working on a beginner's course right now that we'll release, I don't know, a year from now. And I'm making sure that this beginner's course is setting people up for a good balance of invention and copying because you have to have the two to really be a a well-rounded artist, I think. And where did that come from? Because that realization, not the realization, the the education method that you were drawing from life. Is it that you were enrolled in an atelier? Yeah, or it's an atelier. It was an atelier. I mean, they they taught con- some construction, like you you know you you think about forms and stuff, but it was very heavily based on drawing from life. And and, and you know what? They actually they did have illustration classes but I don't know I guess maybe I didn't take those as much as I should have I guess oh interesting I mean, the school was targeted more towards fine art painting which is more like yeah you take a photo and you and you create your art and if you don't know how to paint this one thing this part of the shoulder you you find a model you take a picture of the shoulder and you study from that um, which is a good way to study but there's more I, and I don't know if it was the fault of the school or it was just like I just didn't gravitate towards that stuff. Because I know that there are students that came from the same school as me that are really good at drawing from imagination. So it, like, you know, the school didn't hurt them like that. You know, I don't, I, so I guess it isn't really the school's fault. Um, I think maybe I just needed to do more sketchbooking. 
just just kind of drawing. And, but if we go back even further, like let's say when you're six and seven, like for me, I feel like I was the opposite. It was always just like inventing bad drawings. Like I remember oh. I went home and I found some stuff and, and uh, it was like my character, my big character, his name was Bolt and he had this like stiff arm down pose. It was, it was really bad, but it was always like creating new things. And I feel like I needed more of the drawing from life, drawing from reference, understanding anatomy, understanding proportions and that there's like systems yeah. that you can use on how to draw. Yeah. Um, and I think in Pencil Kings, that's what we see a lot is that people don't want to use reference. Um, I, I'm not sure why. And so there's like, there's this balance that needs to be struck, you know, like 70, 30. And I, I feel like you could do it either way, depending on what you wanted to do or what the interests of the students were. But I'm curious when you were a kid, did you do the same thing? Like just drawing random um, comic books and, and stuff like that? I had a hard time drawing from my head as a kid. I would draw cartoon characters that I would, that I would, I would like look, I would watch TV and I would see this cartoon character that I like, and I would try to draw that cartoon character. I wouldn't pause. I don't. We didn't. We didn't really have like TiVo or any or like DVR. Right. I, I, so that was a good exercise, just drawing from this moving cartoon character. But I was looking at it, and I was trying to draw it by copying. And then I would copy from books and stuff, even as a very young kid, like seven, eight years old. Uh, I know I would copy my brother as well. I don't know how if he created the drawings because yeah he when he was a kid he was a pretty good artist I think like he and I was younger than him by like three or four years so obviously he was like way better than me and I would be like oh wow that's cool and then I would like make the same drawing maybe that's where it started I would just copy my brother. <laughs> ah. Well, I, I'm starting to wonder maybe if people are oriented one way or the other. Like you, you have these people know. who are just like inventing and then there's other other people who are not quite there yet and maybe that it's like a confidence. Because I feel like for me, when I was a kid, there's things that I copied and there's things that I invented. And I think it was a confidence thing that if I had confidence in my skills to do high quality work, then I would have just always invented. I wouldn't want to make something new. But, but that's my personality. Even when I had a band, I hated playing cover songs. I played cover songs because that's what people know. But I didn't. I liked writing my own music. It was always about creating something new, always creating. But see, the thing is... My- with other things in life, I'm the total opposite. I don't like to copy. Like, I like to create. I don't think I'm, like, I, I try to rip people off. Like, with my YouTube channel, I don't, when I started, I don't think I was copying anybody in the way I was making videos. I was trying to create my own way of making videos, and, um, and I, I think I did that well. So I don't, I don't know if it's just me being, like, a copier naturally instead of trying to always create new things. I think it's just visually um, in the way I learned to draw because I, I would say I'm the opposite in other aspects of my life yeah that makes sense and I'm still trying to like distill the artist's brain and how it all works so it can you know if I can decode that then I can be like here's the recipe for success I you know I, I want people yeah, to, be, it's tough. to be able to do what they want and so it's always just like asking these questions and uh, it's it's good Okay, so we, we talked about uh, the, the learning process, and you said you would shortcut the process, I think, uh, instead of taking, was it 15 years and, and kind of compress that, or it was only just in, inserting the, the. Oh, no, uh, I wouldn't compress. Imagine if. You wouldn't no, compress, no, no, I okay. I would not shorten. No, I mean, I'm still learning. I, I don't, I don't, I haven't, I don't think I've ended, like, the time of my life when I was studying was from this to this. I'm still studying. I, what, I, what I meant was, I would replace some of my time that I spent copying and replace it with just drawing from a sketchbook for imagination. Got it. Yeah, a little bit more. I did some of it, like with my animation when, when I was in high school. I did try to create my own characters and I was, I was creating more, but um, once I started going to school and really getting serious about learning how to draw, uh, it was all about just okay. Let's let's copy. Let's let's learn how to draw from from reference. And I would stick more. I would balance it out. I don't know how much. I think everybody has to have their own balance. And maybe I did. Ha- I had my own balance, but I kind of wish I had a different balance. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it might just be a personal opinion because there's artists that, that just copy and they're amazing. It's like you. Yeah, you should just do this. Like just. Just draw from life because you are like the best like draftsman ever. 
So just just keep drawing from life and create beautiful things like that. And other people are just they're so good at just drawing from their head because they have these crazy ideas that they should just stick with that. They shouldn't copy. Why would they copy? Mm -hmm. So some people can lean towards one side heavily and it's great that they do that. For me personally, I wish I I was more in the middle. Yeah, and for me and the people that I see in Pencil Kings, I wish they would lean more the opposite way Mm -hmm. and and draw more from from life and from reference because I feel like it. So yeah, it's definitely uh, a balance. Um, the next thing that I'm curious about is the most recent course that you had on caricatures Mm. and just, I do, I want to throw out a really funny story. So, um, I was in Shanghai, uh, we were building one of the game studios that I built over there and somebody called me and it was like through a friend and they're like, Hey, Mitch is an artist. He knows how to draw. So they called me and they said, Hey, can you come and draw portraits? We're doing a live event. And it was, uh, Veuve Clicquot, I think, is a kind of champagne. I'm probably saying the name wrong, but it was like some, it's, it's apparently some fancy brand of champagne. I don't know okay. much about champagne. I've never heard of it. And so they're having this launch party in Shanghai, or maybe they were just first launching in China. And um, this girl calls me, and so I said, yeah, I can draw portraits, no problem. Like if somebody's sitting there, I can, you know, set up an, an easel, and I've got all my materials, no problem. And so I show up, and they tell me, you're drawing caricatures. And I was just like, F, you know, like I, I, I didn't know how to draw character, and it, and I didn't. I thought all this stuff is like if you can draw one thing, then you can draw something else. But it's definitely not like that. Right. Like you, there's definitely study that's involved, and you have to go through and learn this stuff. So the whole night, I've just been was drawing bad caricatures. I think I drew probably like 50 of them because they told me it's like you got to get these done in like five minutes. You, yeah. You're circulating around this drunken party with it with this giant sketchboard, looking like a nerd. And um, in the 50 that I drew, I probably nailed three where people are like, wow, this is amazing. And the one that I really bombed was the actual, like, the Veuve Clicquot woman who was the main person of the party. So after the, after the party had ended, I, I just had a horrible night um, because I wasn't going to bail and I thought I could do it, but I couldn't. So I stayed, did all the drawings. Um, and because there's all the champagne, I just was like, okay, I'm just going to try and get drunk and at least make something <laughs> out of this. So I'm there at the end of the night. And then the girl who had hired me, her boss is just like berating me for how bad of a job I did and how embarrassed he was. It was one of the worst experiences, uh, professional, we'll, we'll use air quotes here, professional experiences that I'd ever had. And I think it would, just came down to it was a lost in translation thing with, with Chinese uh, language to English and whoever hired me has said portraits, but what they should have said, can you draw caricatures? Right. In which case I would have said no. Right. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm curious about your course and does it start people at the beginning or how, how where does it take them to? Um, it, well, so first of all, I'm not the teacher of the course. Uh, the, the teacher is Court Jones um, and we're, it's a collaboration and he's teaching it on my channel. Um, so he, he starts it off um, about just talking about what caricature is, like, because a lot of people have some misconceptions about caricature, and, and he talks about what, like, what it is. It's mainly that it's you're not just distorting people's faces. You're looking for what makes someone unique, and you're exaggerating. So he he really tries to make that distinction between distortion and exaggeration. There's a very big difference. And so he starts off by just talking about a lot of principles. Then he starts every lesson after that is like one step in his process of creating a uh, like a finished illustration caricature or caricature illustration. Um, you know, you have like your Sea World like you know theme park five minute quick uh, caricature sketches. Mm-hmm. That that kind of that's what most people think of as caricature. Um, and that's like that's a good exercise. But the the course isn't necessarily made to do sketches really quickly really well like that that's just one style um he starts you off by doing thumbnails where it's like really small i mean they don't have to be small but they're really quick rough ideas so you're supposed to do like five ten of them um and you're just kind of exploring various various types of exaggerations that you see and then when you figure out oh okay i think this one is a good one this is a good exaggeration then you take that, or you combine a few of your thumbnails, and you do a rough sketch, and so that you kind of just refine it a little bit. It's not just a thumbnail; it's just a it's a sketch, but it's still kind of rough. You're not it's not a finished sketch. 
Um, then you take the abstraction. If, you, if anyone's heard of the Riley method, uh, it's rhythms of the head or, or the figure as well. But in this case, we're applying the rhythms or the abstraction of the head onto your sketch. And you're kind of just, you're fixing things as that you kind of make it a little bit more accurate towards anatomy and um, proportion, not proportion, sorry. You're, <laughs> proportions are all over the place. But just in the way that the forms on a face balance or, or, or connect to each other, the rhythms of the head will help you keep those accurate while still making sure they're exaggerated. And then he goes on to carry it through to a complete caricature. Um, we haven't gone past that yet. We haven't even launched the abstraction episode yet. Well, actually, when, when this launches, we will. When this podcast launches, we, we'll probably be like a few lessons from now. Um, but yeah, he goes all the way through. And then in part two of the course, he talks about, he shows you a lot of different exercises and um, little games you could, you could play. Um, they're more like exercises that will help you develop your ability to exaggerate. I, I love that. I love, I remember in high school, we used to play a game where you would get like three minutes to draw something and then you had to hand it off to the, Yeah. most people weren't interested, but there's a few of my friends that were interested in drawing in class. So we'd hand it to the next person. We'd come up with the most crazy things. Uh, do you have any examples of the games that, uh, um, here, I just, I'll read them off. Let me see. So, um, because I think it's really cool and, and, you know, people are studying at home and you can kind of get bored. But if you can turn these things into, like, there's no reason why that study can't be really fun and, and silly sometimes or, or whatever. Like, it's, it all helps. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know if they're all, if they're games. They're, they're more like exercises, but they're, you know, it's ways to improve your exaggeration abilities. So let's see. So I'm just reading off the list of, uh, of future lessons here on the sales page. So after the Riley abstraction, he goes into a final shaded drawing of the caricature. Then he shows you how to caricature the body. And then he goes into these different things. So memory sketching. So where you look at a, uh, a person's head and then you try to remember the exaggerations and then you just draw it from memory. Um, that can spark some, some ideas. And it kind of forces you to figure out what those important traits are. Right? You, you have to, when you're trying to memorize them, you really have to analyze quickly and figure that out then there's caricature of a caricature this one's fun <laughs> so you do a caricature of somebody and then you put the photo away and then you caricature your own caricature you exaggerate it even more so that forces people to push farther or further in, in their exaggeration because a lot of people you know some people are naturally just push it really far they're not afraid of it but i think most people don't push it far enough they stick towards like comfortable proportions because they're able to get a likeness better if they stick towards actual proportions and actual shapes that they're seeing instead of just pushing things completely out of reality while still retaining that person's likeness. So caricature of a character helps you get to that. Yeah, that's Expand great. your comfort zone. There's opposition sketching. This one's fun. So um, most of the course is, or the first half of the course, um, he's talking about you know, how do you figure out what's different about the person? Like, well, compared to what? So he's talking about you're comparing it to the average person, right? Like when you look at like a Loomis head, it's kind of like the idealized European male head. Um, that there, you know, and the court says like every um, part of the world has a different average. Like it's not all European males, obviously. Um, so. You kind of just you. Everybody's going to have their own average in their mind. If you don't have your own average in your mind, just I guess use the traditional art one that everyone uses, which is like Loomis proportions, um, and decide what is different about this person from from the Loomis head or from average. But then opposition sketching this exercise. Instead of comparing people to this average, you compare two people. So let's say we're doing an opposition sketch. Um, of like, let's say Donald Trump and like Hillary Clinton. Like you, you, you look at both of their noses and you figure out, okay, what's the difference between his nose and her nose? And then you exaggerate the two even farther away from each other. And you look at what's the difference between her head shape and his head shape. And you exaggerate those. 
So you're comparing two people rather than one person to the average. And that can create new ideas that, that could really, really show somebody's uniqueness by comparing that person to somebody else instead of the average. So I think that's really fun. The next one is spirit animal, where you try to figure out what the person's spirit animal is. And it doesn't even have to be an animal. It could be an object or a fruit or that's, you know, it's like, I don't know, like my, I don't know, giraffe because I got a long neck or something. Um, whatever. It, it could be whatever object you think of when you look at a person. And then you try to make, draw that object and, and like put that person's face on it. You just kind of use that object as inspiration for the character of the person. And that also creates interesting new ideas and shapes and stuff. Um, then he goes on to digital painting, sketching, and then studying the masters and conscious shape design. And those aren't really games or anything, but yeah. So that's the complete course there. Oh, that's that's so cool. I think those exercises really like push you outside your comfort zone, yeah. which is something that you mentioned earlier in the podcast. Lets you come up with new ideas and really. Um, I think if you keep doing that, like you're, you're always going to be evolving because it's something that you don't normally do. You can't do this on your own. You actually have to do exercises like this to, yes. to break into new territory. So a, those are amazing frameworks. Yeah, and I, I, when I was studying character a little bit at school, I've never, I didn't do these things. And I'm like, man, I'm so excited to kind of follow along with the course and do these because they sound really fun, all these little yeah. exercises. Do you have a, a way to like collect the students work and sh like, I feel like yes. seeing some of these things would be so amazing. If you're just like a, a show reel of like, you know, here's the comparison drawing, like here's what, here's what people came up with. Like, isn't this wild? Like, look how far they went with this. This is great. Yeah, we do. One of the main things about our courses is that, um, there's, we do critiques, we do critique videos of the student work. Um, and the way people submit is actually through a Facebook group that we have. So if you go to program.com slash groups, we have a Facebook group for every course that we teach. And one of them is caricature. So if you, we have a Facebook caricature group and all the students are constantly every day posting their exercises. Um, nice. so yeah, it's fun. It's, caricature specifically on the Facebook group for caricature is really fun because everyone's doing like caricatures of the, these celebrities and it's really fun to see everyone's take on it you know the figure drawing and anatomy ones and all those are a little more serious because people are like just like seriously trying to learn how to draw um, caricature is just really fun I like that and I, I think it's so important to keep it fun for a lot of people yeah. like keep the art education fun because yes. at the end of the day it should be fun like if you can manage to make art your career it's pretty pretty good oh yeah it, it, I consider myself really lucky to be doing this. Like, I don't think it's really a job. But it's it's so fun to to do what I do. It's awesome. <laughs> well, we're almost at time. Any any last words to kind of wrap things up? Any big piece of advice or cool things? Actually, let's let's finish with this question. Okay. What's what's the future for Proco? Um, things that you can say or, or like, oh, actually, let, let's say like, <laughs> we're both in art education. If we yeah. go like five years out from art education, which isn't that far, like yeah, we're going to blink in it'll be five years. Wh what do you see happening? Like we've got VR coming, um, self-driving cars. I don't think that's really going to help our art, <laughs> but, um, we might be able to sketch more while driving. That's cool. Yeah. It's oh, that, that actually be really huge. It's great like, sketching opportunities right there. But yeah, f five years for art education. Have you, do you think that far out? Uh, um, I, I have a lot of ideas, but I don't, for my, for like for Proco, but I don't know exactly what will happen. Like I always think I want to make, make it more structured and like make an app where people could like, could f take the course in an app and it'll, it'll help them track their progress and all that. But I don't know if that's really the most important thing for, for, for me right now is to create an app like that or to create a website that where people could, you know, like an app website. I think the most important thing is just creating more videos and lessons because my curriculum here now is very incomplete. There's so much more I can teach and so much more that guest instructors can teach. So I think the future of Proca that you'll see in the next five years is just more instructors coming on to my channel teaching more stuff. Because I, you know, I can teach, there's a lot more that I can teach, but there's a lot that I, I can't teach because I'm not that good at some things or I'm just not that knowledgeable in certain things. 
And so I'm going to be bringing in more instructors to help me kind of fill those gaps and get people a, a complete art education. So, yeah, five years really not that far out. All you you should really expect is just to get uh, a larger body of, of courses in there. Um, in in VR, if we want in, in VR, VR. <laughs> I don't think it. I don't think it's kind of Skelly could be kind of cool in VR. Like I feel like that's something that would naturally translate. But yeah, exactly. It's kind of cool. That's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. I don't know how useful it'll be. It's just kind of cool. I think maybe 20, 30 years from now, there might be some amazing things we're doing with with technology and art. Um, I mean, we are right now with like 3D animation and stuff. That's like the best thing. But in order for VR to make an impact as big as like 3D in animation, I think it's going to take some more time. It's just weird right now. You know, I think it's definitely going to happen, but I don't know. Five years, definitely not. All right. Well, we'll hold you to it. We'll have you back in five years. It's so weird. Have you tried it? <laughs> have you tried I have. I, I tried an early Oculus. It is extremely pixelated. Oh, but what I and it's different. It, well, okay. Yeah, and, but but still, I like I love video games since I was a kid. The thing that I wanted to do was to um, you know like to have more interactive environments. And so you know I, I got working in video games, and then I it was just like wait a second. We still have a controller, and we're still watching the game on a box. This has not changed since Pong. Since the very start, it hasn't changed. Yeah. And finally with VR, it's like, okay. When I was playing that game, even though it was super pixelated early Oculus, I almost fell off my chair. Like I just did almost did a somersault roll because I kept leaning forward and just had this really uneasy feeling. Yeah. It, it wasn't a great experience, but it was a new experience, and that's what I think is so experience, uh, exciting for it. So we'll see. I have a vibe. Jealous? Yeah, <laughs> it's cool, but it's just kind of you know it's it's just cool. It's it's not. There's a long way to go for it to feel better than just holding a remote control. Personally, really, wow. it just gets weird. Like my neck starts to hurt because I have this heavy thing on my head, and you got these wires coming out the back. I mean, I I know that all that stuff is going to change quickly. Like the heavy mm -hmm. thing on your head and wires coming out, like. Yeah, five years from now, they won't have it. It'll be wireless, and it'll be way lighter, and it'll feel better on your head. Um, but I guess just, like, being in this other environment, I don't know. I like reality. I don't <laughs> I, I know people, like, five years from now are going to listen to this, and they're going to be like, oh, my God, so, so behind the times. He has no vision. <laughs> That's that's fine. I think that's the great part about making these predictions or like speculating that you can look back and be like, "Wow, yeah, I was really right," or, or I was totally wrong. You know, totally wrong. Yeah, it's, just it's I'm it's interesting. Be totally wrong. It's probably going to be like five years from now. It's going to change everything. And like one thing I do see that could happen, but I just don't know how, is that like VR people could have like virtual classrooms where. It, it will get a little bit closer to actually having the teacher right there in front of you uh, or behind you actually looking at you draw something. Like let's say you have a virtual classroom with a life drawing model and then everyone's just sitting there like in normal class and then the teacher is in a totally different country but can walk around in the same room and look at people's drawings and then just be like, hey, hold on, let me take a seat and then let me fix your drawing. And it, it'll mimic like an actual classroom, um, and that could be cool. But you, you know, there, it's I think it's a long way from now because making those things happen, it's like it just takes years for people to get comfortable with stuff like that, like drawing in three D. I've tried it, and it's really, really weird. It's the biggest like it's it's the most uncomfortable new tool I've ever used. You know, I've gone from oil painting to digital painting, and it was a little weird, but I got used to it, you know, within a, within a few months, and within a few days, it was like, okay. With VR, painting in VR it was so weird, totally unnatural for me. I don't know. Um, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time to make drawing in VR feel natural. Well, we'll see. Uh, I'm going to set a boomerang reminder for your email. Yeah. And be like, hey. <laughs> Let's go listen to this episode and see. Yeah. See, let's just go, skip to to minute whatever and and listen to these predictions for two or three minutes. Know. 
because it's exciting if they get it right. You know. Yeah, I I I really like the uh, that that idea of the the virtual classroom that yeah because I feel like there's only so many amazing teachers um, and if they could have a, be able to have a wider impact that would be really great and there's only so many amazing schools um, and if those environments could be made accessible to more people just so that we're able to get access to better resources I think that's so yeah it's so great for for everybody um, but we, we'll see yeah. Um, so. I think that's it. Is there any special place? Is it just uh, that you want people to go and visit or um, uh, just check you proko. out? Just proko.com. Yeah, P-R-O-K-O.com. That's where all my, my lessons are. Um, and if anybody's going to be in the Washington area, um, I'm going to be teaching a workshop in April, like late April, um, in uh, Whidbey Island in Washington. I'll be teaching a figure drawing class. Cool. So, yeah. You can just go on Whidbey Island website and they have all the information there. Perfect. And uh, as usual, we'll have show notes over at uh, pencilkings.com slash podcast. So cool. thanks, Proko. Really appreciate you hopping on the podcast. Yeah, it was great talking to you. It was fun. Hey, it's Mitch again. I just wanted to come back and let you guys know that Stan has very generously offered you 20% off of all of his products when you use the coupon code PENCILKINGS. That's PENCILKINGS as one word, so don't put a space there, and you'll get 20% off. So that's it for me, and I'll look forward to coming back to your earbuds in the next episode. Good demand patience, skill, years of practice. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.